intelligencesquared.com. Our next speaker against the motion is Deborah Brautigam. Deborah is the Professor of International Development at the American University in Washington. And she's also the author of a book called The Dragon's Gift, which was one of the first and certainly one of the most quoted books on this subject of Chinese involvement in Africa. And I would say that she's been studying this for longer than most people realized it was an issue. So Deborah, your 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this invitation to come and debate this motion. And let me start by saying that I agree with George Aite in one respect. Africa's not going to, China's not going to save Africa. And they would regard the very notion of saving Africa as most peculiar. What you've heard just now in a lot of uh, Mr. Aite's argument of verbosum is the conventional wisdom. And uh, if I, all I knew about China and Africa was what I read in British newspapers, I'd be wor very worried as well. But fortunately, that's not the case. How often have you read that China is propping up pariah states with billions of dollars in concessional loans? Or that China is leading the land grab in Africa? Or that they bring in all their own workers? Or that they dictate the terms of contracts? Or that they're, uh, what else? That they're wiping out African manufacturing? Um, Actually, none of this conventional wisdom happens to be true. Uh, so you can't rely on what you read in the newspapers for your evidence. Public opinion polls carried out by Afrobarometer in 20 African countries show that Africans broadly welcome the Chinese presence, and they rate them 70% positively. And this is very similar to what they give for Britain, Portugal, and France, which is about 72%. And actually, the United States won. We got 77%. Uh, in a popular approval in these polls. Now, Africans are continuing to welcome the Chinese, and for good reason. This emerging relationship is not without its problems, and some of them were pointed out by Mr. Aite. Like other developing countries, Chinese banks and Chinese companies have low social and environmental standards. And that's why, for example, China Exim Bank has brought in a Swiss company to help them with their environmental impact assessments. In some countries, Chinese traders are competing in the marketplace with African traders. In Ethiopia, this doesn't happen because the Ethiopian government checks up on business licenses and uh, import permits and uh, work permits, and they don't let it happen. And other countries are not so strict, and so it does happen. Counterfeits are a problem. And when I was in Tanzania, I talked to a Chinese pharmaceutical company that was fighting counterfeits of its own brand name products in uh, Tanzanian markets. But I think despite these real challenges, uh, China's role in Africa has been largely positive, and I'm gonna make five main points about this. First is that China is an economic engine, is pulling Africa. And it may surprise you, especially after what you just heard, that the World Bank reports that Africa is largely on track to meet the Millennium Development Goal of reducing poverty by half. And they should meet this a little bit late by 2017. And China has been an important part of this. Uh, poverty reduction is directly related to the economic growth rates that we've seen in Africa. There's an OECD study that found that for every one percentage rise in China's growth, 7.7 .7 million people outside of China were lifted out of poverty. And they said that China may be, outside its borders, the most potent poverty reduction engine that we've seen in the 21st century. And my second point is about infrastructure. And you've already heard uh, how the infrastructure gap in Africa is quite profound. Now, to develop, Africa needs to reduce its high production costs. And this means better infrastructure. Um, the West, in general, has been funding things that are not infrastructure. They've been funding NGOs and the social sectors and health and microfinance. And these are all good things. Uh, China's financing infrastructure, and these days it's more than $6 billion a year. And it's helping to fill this gap as having a positive impact. Uh, after Liberia's war ended, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf said that her main priority was financing roads. And the donors sat there and they said, we don't do roads. But the Chinese ambassador said, we'll do roads. And so the donors started to change. And I think we can see this happening around the continent now. In Angola, where Chinese banks have put in, at this point, $14.5 billion in infrastructure, the 
rate of absolute poverty dropped from 68% to 36% uh, over the past decade. Now, the conventional wisdom disparages the quality of this infrastructure, but the World Bank and the African Development Bank don't agree. The Chinese companies are carrying out the majority of the road projects that they issue. There are two kinds of Chinese finance, and they're often conflated. Let me just explain this. Despite the conventional wisdom, China's official aid, the stadiums, hospitals, these kinds of things, they don't show any pattern of concentration in resource-rich countries. They're distributed across the continent. And the idea that China uses these kinds of things to get access to natural resources or pays for its natural resources with hospitals and stadiums is false. This may come from a misunderstanding about how these big packages operate. So let me explain briefly. In the late 1970s, when China was just emerging from the Cultural Revolution, they were already a major exporter of oil to Japan. And Japan came to them and said, we'll make you a bargain. We'll give you a line of credit worth $10 billion. And you can use that to import technologies from us. Our companies can help you develop your power plants and modernize your ports. And you can repay us with these existing oil exports that you already have. So, China is offering the same kind of package, the same kind of bargain to many African countries. And that bargain is leverage what you're already exporting to us. If it's Congo Brazzaville, it's oil. If it's Ghana, it's cocoa. If it's Ethiopia, it's sesame. So use these to build the infrastructure that you want for your country's modernization. This is not a barter system. The loans are not concessional. It's not foreign aid. It's exports that go into an escrow account, and then they are used to secure and repay these loans. Infrastructure gets built, of course, largely by Chinese companies, although this is negotiable. Angola, for example, negotiated 30% of the loan should go to pay for Angolan firms to do their infrastructure. And despite popular belief, the evidence shows that in almost none of these cases is it linked to a Chinese company getting a concession. In fact, the Nigeria example that you just heard about, it was the Nigerians' idea that they would swap the access to those four uh, blocks for the infrastructure. And by the way, this all fell apart at the last elections in Nigeria. So the West simply imports raw materials from Africa and sends the cash back. We don't know what happens to it. But the Chinese have figured out a way to make this resource work for development. Now the third point is that China is building up African manufacturing. And this is what Africa needs to move out of its poverty. Um, in many countries, Chinese imports have hurt African import substitution industries, particularly in the textile sector. This is very true. But if you look at the data, you'll see something interesting. Africa's deindustrialization happened in the 80s and 90s under structural adjustment. Industrialization sank. But in the last five years, between 2005 and 2009, manufacturing has increased by 5% per year on the continent, just as China is there engaging. And what's happening is that rising costs in China are pushing their factories offshore. Um, they're building up six special economic zones in Africa to attract these companies to come and invest there. And China's allowing in duty-free access for more than 400 goods from Africa's poorest countries. And these, if you look at the list, which is on my blog if you're interested, these are largely manufactured goods. And this provides another incentive for companies to move to Africa. And Africans are welcoming this. Last week, I was in Ethiopia in the Ministry of Industry, and I listened to an official tell me with great glee that he had just finalized this agreement uh, for a major Chinese company, the largest shoe manufacturer in Guangdong, to move to Ethiopia. And that company had already hired 100 Ethiopians and sent 49 of them to China for training before they opened their factory early next year. So when was the last time a British factory opened uh, a big, a British uh, company moved a big factory to Africa? The fourth um, point is that Chinese companies are expanding employment in Africa. This may be hard for you to believe. If we look to um, Libya, to Algeria, and to Angola, we do see large numbers of Chinese working there. And that's not surprising. These are areas that have large numbers of other foreigners working as well. In Angola, for example, there are 92,000 Portuguese, according to The Economist. But this is far from the norm for the Chinese. In the countries where I've looked, in most parts of Africa, it's 10 or 20% Chinese on any given project and about 80 or 90% African. Now, the reality is that Chinese mines and infrastructure projects and factories are employing Africans, uh, and it's new employment. The problem is the terms of this employment and the standards under which it's being offered, the wages that are being paid, they're at Chinese standards, not European standards. Uh, this needs to be changed. It's understandable why they're like that. Um, my last point is on governance. 
It's widely believed that Chinese firms prefer to invest in pariah states where they can get better terms. Uh, this actually isn't the case. The evidence shows that Chinese firms are a lot like ours. They want to invest in stable, well-governed countries that, where they have secure property rights. That's why, for example, two countries, Australia and Canada, together have received more Chinese investment than almost the entire continent of sub-Saharan Africa. And why in Africa the top destination continues to be South Africa. Are the Chinese impeding democracy and governance in Africa? I don't see this. According to Freedom House, between uh, 20, 2000 and 2010, when China was ratcheting up its engagement there, uh, political and civil liberties showed no decline across the continent. More governments than ever have been voted into power recently and more peacefully. And even a poster child for corruption, like Angola. Governance and transparency have improved to the extent that the IMF now has a standby agreement with Angola. And recently, Standard & Poor's raised its credit rating for Angola at the same time that they were lowering ours. So uh, let's look most, more closely at some of the cases in which the Chinese have been involved. Sudan. China did an about-face in Sudan. Yes, they did not play a constructive role. 2004, 5, 6, 7. But in 2008, they changed. Um, they persuaded Khartoum to accept a joint AU-African uh, Union and UN peacekeeping force. Um, and as Khartoum and Juba were negotiating the referendum that led to the independence of South Sudan earlier this year, Beijing's diplomats stayed very closely engaged to keep Khartoum on track. Uh, this was against their short-term interests because all the oil is in South Sudan and Khartoum is their pal. Uh, but they did this, and they even sent a monitoring team um, at the referendum. In 2007, when Sierra Leone's president lost the election and then didn't want to step down, a group of ambassadors went to meet with him to persuade him that he had to give up power, and the Chinese ambassador was in that group. It's interesting. In Guinea, after a military junta took power at the end of December, uh, pundits predicted that China would step in and prop up the junta so they could get exclusive access to Guinea's rich resources. This didn't happen. Guinea had an election which has been described as the most fair in their country's history after that. In Zambia, China has deep economic interests and, and real reason to be wary of Michael Sata, who just won the election because, because he campaigned on an anti-China platform. But when uh, Sata won the election earlier this year, there wasn't, uh, the Chinese didn't put any obstacle in the way of this, uh, the transition happened. And President Sata's first meeting after the election was with the Chinese ambassador. So I think this shows some things. Africans know that when it comes to democracy and governance, the West is hypocritical. Uh, China is, as we hear, controlled by the Communist Party, it's non-democratic, it's authoritarian, it's repressive, it has human rights abuses in China, and yet the West has been lining up to trade and invest with China for decades. And they've done very well out of it, the Chinese have done very well out of it, 1.3 billion Chinese people have done very well on it, out of it. And yet Africans wonder why the West keeps warning them away from China. Now, remember again, the public opinion about China in Africa is broadly positive. Africans don't want to have to choose between China and the West, and they shouldn't have to. China is filling important roles in Africa in infrastructure, in manufacturing. They're offering policy space so that Africans have a chance to make their own decisions about things. They're emphasizing mutual benefit, which is the basis on which they're operating there. It's not a bad recipe for development. It's not a bad recipe for a relationship. And it's something that we should let play out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirka. <laughs> Stay there. Don't move. Don't move. Anna, you are desperate to ask something. Yes, according to the African Development Bank, China imports, according to the statistics, they are known because much is not known, but it looks like China imports something like 34% of their imports from Angola, 20% from South Africa, 11% from Sudan, and aid from the DRC, uh, mostly crude oil and minerals. Uh, one area where Africa has definitely a comparative advantage is, is food production, is agriculture. And uh, uh, China's high level of consumption of food, of food is also taking a toll in terms of uh, uh, elevating the prices for food. Why isn't Africa, if, uh, if, if, why isn't China important more agriculture from Africa and helping Africa develop its capacities in agriculture apart from 
the, the manufacturing effort you're, you just reflected. Re Thank you for mentioned. asking that. They are, actually. Um, as you may know from the statistics, what China imports from Africa in the agricultural sector is largely cotton. That's the biggest thing. And so that goes into the textile industry in China. Uh, but they have set up um, 20 agrotechnology demonstration centers in 20 different countries. And I just heard in Ethiopia that they're going to expand that now to 30. So that's just one per country. And in Ethiopia, they've, they've had for more than uh, a decade, they've, had, they've sent Chinese experts to work in the agricultural technology vocational schools. And so they've been uh, having these teams of about 15 people every year that have gone. Um, they're not investing in large scale agribusiness in Africa. That's not to say they're not interested in that. They're certainly going to places like Brazil, and they're looking at Argentina and, and Southeast Asia. They've also invested. But they don't actually find this to be very profitable in Africa right now. So what you find is where they have invested, they're investing for local production. In Zambia, for example, there are more than 25 Chinese farms. They all produce for the local market. It's controversial, because their chickens are bigger than the Zambians' chickens, and people don't like that. But they are producing food in Africa for Africans. Okay, one more question from this side. Yeah, um, one of the things that I, I, I like to put to you is that um, many Africans speak from experience, and that is from our history. We have known that every foreign entity that goes to Africa goes there to pursue their interest. The Chinese are not in Africa because they love black people so much. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the question which I, uh, I would like to put to you is that have you noticed that the investment in infrastructure is strategic. That is, they want resources. Then obviously, they would like to develop the infrastructure, the roads, the railway system to take the resources out. Deborah. Yes, the Chinese want resources, but when you look at the infrastructure, there's not a relationship between the Chinese infrastructure and the resources. I know this is a myth that's often believed, but look at Angola. The Chinese have put in now $14.5 billion. The oil is offshore. This infrastructure is going all around the country. This is reconstruction. Uh, if you look at the DRC, the roads that they're building, they're all to link the DRC to its neighbors on the east. This is not about uh, channeling resources out. If you look at Ethiopia, there are 25 Chinese companies there building infrastructure. Ethiopia has almost nothing in the way of resources. So they're in there to make money. In fact, Chinese companies in 2009 signed contracts worth 40 three billion dollars for infrastructure. And they're doing this for African governments who are, are commissioning this work, the World Bank, the African Development Bank. So it's, there are of course cases where there is a mine that needs the railway to the coast. But tell me where that's actually happened yet. Okay, hold that thought, hold that thought. You can tell her later, Deborah. <laughs> 